Yeah, let's get started. Uh, it's late already. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. I hope you are well rested because we're going to walk fast today. I want to finish these lectures and there's a lot of material. Uh, I apologize I didn't put these slides online yet because I had to work on them this yesterday evening and this morning. So we left uh, yesterday uh, by showing three different methods for deriving confidence intervals and uh, they are the frequentist uh, Neyman construction and the Bayesian method and uh, the likelihood ratio method. And uh, so let's take it from there. So. I want to go through a very quick uh, stupid example of a zero background counting experiment. We discussed this kind of thing earlier where we observe uh, three events. We already discussed this particular case. So we want to determine the upper limit on the signal. Here is just to show how the methods differ. And uh, let's say, let's take a 10% type one error rate the Bayesian upper limit uh, will uh, determine a posterior, and then we'll find uh, the upper point of the true value mu such that posterior probability is, uh, is uh, 10%. Uh, and this is, uh, you might say, oh, but this is also integrating on values not seen. No, but this is, uh, the, the Bayesian construction constructs a full posterior, so then you can do what you want with it. It's not like, uh, in the frequentist calculation where you are actually asking yourself, what if I got uh, n plus one and if I got n plus two, this is directly doing inference on the probability distribution of the true value. So it's a totally different uh, standpoint. The likelihood ratio method uh, will find the upper limit uh, such that uh, the ratio of likelihoods or the difference of log likelihoods as the value that corresponds to that. And instead, the frequentist one-sided uh, confidence level, we saw that uh, we saw we saw how we compute it. In fact, uh, that uh, we 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 integrate the probability on in the critical region in the in the region of interest, if you want. What is the probability that it is less than three events uh, given mu up uh, of uh, and and you, you find mu up such that this probability is, is zero point one. So the answers that these three methods give are different because they are asking different questions, of course. And uh, it is not possible to say which method is best. It depends on you a little bit. It depends on what you want to do with the result that you get. It depends on who you are, what kind of science you're doing. In particle physics, uh, we tend to prefer the second or the third, okay? Um, one thing we saw, and, uh, and I'll stress again, is that uh, we are often in the regime of small statistics because, because we look for rare signals. And uh, therefore, likelihood intervals uh, uh, suffer from small, small statistics more than other methods because they are based on the assumption that the likelihood has a nice, uh, smooth uh, Gaussian profile or, or if you want, parabolic. And this is Wilkes theorem, which we'll touch on later on. And in this case, uh, when uh, these asymptotic properties are not valid, you, you, the intervals that you derive uh, will have poorer properties. And we saw that already. OK, so we turn the page because we are done with confidence intervals. We spent a lot of time doing point, point and interval estimation these lectures, I think it's important because it's most of the stuff that we do. But uh, another important thing that we do in, uh, in uh, fundamental science is to do hypothesis testing. In fact, we use intervals to do hypothesis testing. There, are, there is a duality between getting an interval or an upper limit and testing an hypothesis, in fact, because you are testing whether the cross-section is larger than a certain value, if you want. But uh, the 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 mechanism for doing hypothesis testing is pretty simple, and we'll go through it. But of course, uh, the, the devil is in the details. There are many things that uh, one needs uh, a magnifying lens uh, to go through and understand. So first of all, we touched on this a lot 
several times, but then we never went really formally about it, and this is a slide about it. The statistical significance of a signal. What is it? What do we mean by it? Statistical significance reports the probability that you will obtain data that is at least as odd, as extreme, as the one that you got in frequentist setting under a given null hypothesis. So you are assuming a null hypothesis. The standard model is true. There is no supersymmetry. Then what is the probability that I should get the data that I saw? So given the data, given a test statistic, which is a function of the data, a way that you summarized, compressed the information. You have multidimensional data, lots of data, and then uh, multiple features. And you cook up a one-dimensional test statistic. This is a in machine learning. Since we are doing machine learning here, this is uh, called the dimensionality reduction problem. And, and in fact, uh, all, of, uh, all of these methods uh, in, in machine learning, many of them are, are doing exactly that. They are cooking up a statistic, which is a compressed uh, uh, information about uh, the multidimensional data that you have. And then you, do, you can do a rock curve if you're doing classification, or it's directly the, the, the regression uh, problem that gives you the number you want. Okay, but let me not divagate because we have little time today. So uh, you can obtain a p-value as the probability that you obtain a value of test statistic, at least as extreme. And then this p-value, so it's a tail probability. You integrate the distribution of the test statistic from the point obtained to infinity in the region of interest. So excesses of events then integrate until infinity. But it might be in a situation where you, when you were testing for small values of something. And then you integrate to minus infinity or to zero if the quantity is positive defined. And then this, uh, so this is, this, is, this is how you do it. And then you can convert this p-value that you got into a value of x. And this value of x is the value at which the integral of a Gaussian distribution, a unit Gaussian, will be equal to p. So you see that there is a, a bijective mathematical map between the p-value and the z-value. Talking about the p-value and talking about the z-value are two completely equivalent things. It's like talking about petabytes or nanometers to make a shortcut, you use the z-value because it uh, avoids talking about many zeros if the p-value is small. So with this recipe, a 16% probability is one standard deviation if you're doing a one-tailed test because the one sigma intervals will cover 68% and then you will have 16% on both sides. And you are only looking in one direction, so that is 16%. And 0.13% uh, is, is corresponding to three standard deviations. And this fatidic number, this uh, 2.9, 10 to the minus uh, 6, uh, 10 to the minus 7, sorry, corresponds to five standard deviations, the five sigma that allows you to publish the observation of a new phenomenon. So this convention uh, that we have is to use a one-tailed Gaussian. So we integrate the Gaussian only in one direction. So we have a Gaussian, and we find the point such that this integral is equal to the prescribed type 1 error rate, or I mean, this is the p-value, OK? And we don't care the similar excesses, the, the similar uh, extreme effects that you could get in the opposite direction, typically. Not always, but typically. And then the conversion of the p-value into the sigma value, the z-value, is independent on the experimental detail. It's a mathematical map. You have put the experiment aside, the test statistic aside. You are only dealing with maths here. Using the number of sigma is just a shortcut. It doesn't say anything about your systematic uncertainties being Gaussian or anything. It's not that because you are using a Gaussian for this translation, it implies anything on your PDFs of the experiment. Be careful not to confuse the two things. Yeah? And this whole thing, this whole conversion thing, is resting on the flatness of this. What is this? This is the p-value under the null hypothesis. That means that if you resample your experiment many times, you will get a small p-value, a large p-value, a medium p-value, and at the end, you will get something like this. 
because you are always sampling the standard model, there is no supersymmetry, you are only getting uh, excesses and deficits that uh, balance off. And the p-value of those will be flat. That means that you are computing things well. And if this is even slightly not flat, then you shouldn't even use the p-value itself and even leave alone to <laughs> start quoting a z-value. Because any shortcoming of this distribution will invalidate totally the meaning of the derived number of standard deviations that you are quoting. So if you have a situation like this, and beware, this is very common, because you may underestimate the uncertainties in some part of your problem. You may have uh, insufficient Monte Carlo statistics in the templates that you fit for, for the distribution, from which you get a chi-squared, which you convert in the p-value, or you may have other effects. Okay, so if this is the case, don't, don't do it. Don't, don't even think about quoting sigmas, okay? So, hypothesis testing. The type one error rate, we defined it already. You go to test for COVID and they tell you that you have COVID, but in fact you don't. There is a probability that that happens. That is the type one error rate of the COVID test. And we want it small. And how small do we want it? Well, it depends what you are doing. We want it very small. 3, 10 to the minus 7 is what physicists agreed upon. And strictly connected to the type 1 error rate is power, which is 1 minus beta. And beta is the other player in this. Beta is the type 2 error rate. So 1 minus beta is called power. But beta is the type 2 error rate. The type 2 error rate is defined as the probability of accepting the null hypothesis when the alternative is true. You go to test for COVID, and you have COVID, but they say, oh, you're fine, you're negative. Okay, there is a probability that the test fails this way. And you may well imagine that alpha and beta are very tightly linked. If a test has a very small type 1 error rate, it cannot have a very large power and therefore a very small type 2 error rate. You cannot minimize both at the same time. So you have to decide where you live in the alpha versus beta plane. And to see it graphically, let's look at this graph, which shows a test statistic for your particular experiment. And this is the distribution that the test statistic takes under the null hypothesis, let's say. And this is the test statistic distribution under the alternative hypothesis. So let's say that this is the COVID test, and uh, it gives a number. And uh, for patients that do not have COVID, they distribute more or less like a Gaussian in this region. But people that have COVID will have a different distribution of this variable, the one versus two lines in the thing that you put in your nose or something like that. So you can see that uh, very well that if you choose a critical region, you choose a point beyond which you say you have COVID, you have to choose this point. And you can decide for a tighter test or a looser test. And it depends where you set the bar, and you can choose where to set the bar. But, but this will determine the type 1 error rate that is the integral of the null hypothesis from this point to infinity, the red region. And you see here I have a type 1 error rate of 5%, and here I have a type 1 error rate of 1%. So this test is more, is more is stronger, right? I, 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 if I have positive, uh, I'm pretty sure that I have COVID in this case, because the bar has moved to the right, because I'm sampling less of H0 and more of H1 here. But H1 doesn't have to bear on the type 1 error rate. The, 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 the only thing that bears on alpha is the integral of the null distribution. But automatically, if you are setting a critical region by setting the bar here, you, are, you, you want yourself to be wrong about people te telling people that they do have COVID when they don't fewer times, so you choose the bar on the right, and then you enlarge this red re yellow region here. What is the yellow region? It's the type 2 error rate. The type 2 error rate becomes larger. It becomes an ineffective test because it will miss on a lot of people. It will tell people, go home, you're fine, while in fact they have COVID. 
So if you want to not let people off the hook so easily, you have to loosen the type 1 rate, uh, loosen the test, and then the type 1 error rate becomes larger. Do you get this? Is this clear? Because it's very important that you get this picture. Okay, so it's a conflicting criterion, okay? And you can actually put it on a graph, alpha versus beta, and you can decide the different test statistics and plot their, their alpha versus beta uh, uh, values. And, and the reason why you can do this is because it, it, you will have, you can cook, cook up a certain test statistic and uh, this will be the distribution for the null and this will be the distribution for the alternative. But then you have a colleague that says, oh, but look, if we could include this variable and take off this variable and do this other combination, I come up with this, and this, uh, this is better because you see H1 and H2 are more Gaussian or better defined, but it doesn't really matter. It, the, what, what matters is this overlap region, how much, how large it is, and how do we get uh, order in this situation? What, what to choose between the two, these two test statistics? We plot alpha versus beta by changing the point, and, and we get this kind of graphs where if you decrease alpha, you increase beta. And so you decrease the power of the test because the other thing we didn't say about this is that the power of the test is one minus beta. So it is this, uh, this part of the H1. So you see the power of the test is telling me how often do I correctly flag the positive cases. Okay, the power is this. So you can see that, uh, that uh, I, there are different possibilities. There, there can be a test statistic that is good here but is uh, worse than, so B is better than A here because it is closer to a step function in this region, but then A is better than B here. It goes closer to a step function. You want a step function, but you can never get it. And there is a thing called neyman pearsons the statistic, the likelihood ratio of Neyman and Pearsons that is better than any other test statistics in a simple versus simple hypothesis under some regularity conditions. We'll get there, okay? But it's only valid if, uh, if you have a simple versus simple hypothesis and, and you cannot always apply it. But uh, so this graph is important so you can compare different, uh, different ways to draw inference. And uh, another thing to say is that as the data size increases, you are naturally moving towards the step function because the power of the data grows, and so your power grows. The two test statistics will grow far apart, and then it will be easier to place a cut in, the, in between them. And another graph that we already saw when we discussed the die example is the graph of power as a function of the true value of the variable, uh, the true value of the variable that you are testing. And you can then look at various different test statistics, and you will have, you see, alpha versus beta, maybe in this case. I don't know if this alpha and this, this, this A and B test statistic are the same of the previous graph because actually it doesn't look like it because uh, alpha is better than beta in some region and, and, and it doesn't marry well with the fact that alpha here, A here is always below B. But okay, you, you get the picture. You have to choose where to live in this graph as well in the sense that you want high power, but some test statistic will give you high power in some part of the of the parameter space, but then they will have a you will need to choose a different one. And you cannot choose the test statistic based on the value of theta because you don't know theta, right? If you have one test statistic that is above all others for any parameter value, then you have the uniformly most powerful test. And that will often be the name and Pearson test and simple under simple, the over simple. Uh, the simple hypothesis is an hypothesis that doesn't depend on any unknown parameter. We'll get there. So if I'm, if I am, uh, so if I am testing the uh, X mass being 125 GV versus the X mass being 130 GV, this is a simple versus simple test. It doesn't depend on anything. I fixed everything. But if I'm testing the X mass being 125 against the X mass being anything else, 
this is a simple versus composite test because the alternative hypothesis that is not 125 depends on the parameter itself. So Neyman Pearson's lemma works best when you have two simple hypotheses to test. And uh, we were discussing significance. This guy, I think, is still alive. I might be wrong, but Arthur Rosenfeld is a guy that was uh, a physicist active uh, in the 60s, 70s of last century. And uh, you know, that was the period, a period when resonances were found uh, often uh, in, uh, in uh, adronic collisions of uh, fixed target uh, experiments. People were used uh, to, to look at histograms of uh, uh, invariant masses of pairs or triplets of particles, and they were finding bumps in spectra. And there was no notion of, uh, of uh, a discovery level significance. People were just looking at the spectra and saying, I see a structure here. And so this might be a resonance, and they were publishing these papers. So, and uh, Rosenfeld was looking at the status of the field, and he published a paper titled, Are there any far out mesons or baryons? And in it, he demonstrated that the number of claims uh, of new particles agreed with the number of statistical fluctuations that one would expect, given the mass of data that was analyzed, the number of analyzers, the number of histograms that were being looked at. And this meant, basically, that all of this, well, it might be interpreted to mean that these were all statistical flukes. And it was a problem because theorists were busy looking at these, uh, at these discoveries or fake discoveries. And, uh, well, you have to feed the theorists in some way. But, okay, the issue here is, of course, the one of large trials factors. We'll get into the trials factors later on. It's called look elsewhere effect in particle physics. And it's coming from the fact that you are doing hypothesis testing multiple times. You are testing for the mass of the particle being 100 MeV and then 110 MeV or 120 MeV or GeV or whatever you have. So you're doing it many times. The probability of a fluctuation multiplies by the number of times that you are testing. And so, he says, this reasoning of multiplicity, the number of times you're testing, extended to all combination of all outgoing particles and to all countries where this is done, leads to an estimate of 35 million mass combinations calculated per year. We had many, he's computing the number of, of events that are collected in bubble chamber experiments, for instance. How many histograms are plotted from these 35 million combinations? A glance through the journals show that the typical mass histograms has about 2,500 entries, so the number we were looking for is 15,000 15, histograms per year. And so he's trying to compute the, the trials factor. And uh, it has 40 beans. This means that they're in a physicist could observe 40 different fluctuations, one being wide, 39 that are two beans wide. So, Basically, you plot a histogram, and uh, this maybe it has some shape, but maybe it has a high beam there, and somebody will get very excited about this. And if you have 40 beams, there are 40 possible points where a fluctuation arises by chance. But if you are only interested in two beam bumps, then uh, it's a little bit less frequent that you get a situation like this, but you still do. And you can compute these numbers with toys. I've done it. You could do it. And so he had already done the calculation in T68 and no computers to do toys then, but he concluded that uh, there was a certain number of upward fluctuation in the two to three digits uh, uh, range every year. So that is a problem, and he concluded to the theorist of phenomenologists, the moral is simple. Wait for nearly five sigma effects. So he's the first one that uh, advocated five sigma criterion for discovery level significance. But for the experimental group who has spent a year of their time and perhaps a million dollars, the problem is harder. You want to go ahead and publish the result. But they should realize that any bump less than about five sigma calls for a repeat of the experiment. Okay, so this is the birth of the five sigma criteria. And one of the reasons why this, uh, it, it has stuck, but only after 1993, I think, because already in the 80s, in the 70s, people were not paying a lot of attention to this. But uh, 
I think starting with the top quark search and discovery, we applied it rigorously in particle physics. And one of the reasons why we apply it uh, is that uh, maybe sometimes we do not have so large trials factors, which were the motivation of Rosenfeld to advocate for a five sigma criterion. But we have systematic uncertainties of unknown origin. And so in some way, having a very small type one error rate protects us from quoting fake discovery claims because uh, the systematics can really screw up your measurement of, uh, of the number of Zs. What are systematic uncertainties that play in? They, 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 there are a number of ways that a systematic bias, you know, affects your measurements. So typically, what we do is uh, that we size up the typical variation of an observable quantity due to imprecise model of some nuisance parameter at one sigma. So what we do, we used to do it often. We have Pizia and we have Herwig. Which one is true? This model gives me this distribution. This other model gives me that distribution. Let's look at the variation on our observable based on using Erwig or using Pythia. And the, the, this variation at one sigma, uh, we, can, we can sort of propagate it through our, our inference. But this is only testing the bulk of the distributions. But the tails, the, the, the different uh, models on the tails of the distribution will remain unknown to you. And this is what really hurts when you are looking for very rare extreme events. So if the PDF of your data has larger tails than you expect, because PTA was wrong and it gave you a distribution that died out on the tails, so you find an event in the tail and you think it's much, much, much less probable than it actually is, you may be wrong by a large factor. So the potential harm of large non-Gaussian tails, because we, we tend to believe that everything is Gaussian, so we assume Gaussian distributions on the tails, typically. And then uh, uh, this is one arguable reason for sticking to five sigma significance, even if you have not a large look elsewhere effect trials factor to correct for. So if you're looking for supersymmetry, you're looking in many different places. You don't know. There are many, many possible realizations. So you throw the net and you see what you catch, and uh, there you have a large trials factor. Uh, but if you are looking for single top, which is what uh, CDF and D0 uh, started to look at uh, after they discovered the top quark in 1995, you know, single top is the process whereby a top quark uh, is produced. Uh, uh, it could be produced in association with a bottom quark in W star production. Uh, or it could be pro produced uh, in, uh, by, by, some, uh, by some more exotic phenomenon where, where, whereby it, uh, it, it is generated by a, by a gluon splitting of BB bar and then you have a W boson that, uh, in the T channel. But OK, you can have single top production. Actually, you cannot have a standard model without single model a single top production. So it is clear that this exists, basically. And it, we know exactly where to look for, because we have fixed the top mass. We know what the top mass is. We know everything about the top mass now that we have measured it. And still, CDF and D0 took uh, 13 years to actually produce observation level significance of signal top after they discovered the top quark because it's actually less prominent, the signal is less distinctive, and uh, it is very difficult to extract it from backgrounds. Why to go all the way to five sigma? The three sigma could have been enough, right? Because we don't have any trials factor here. We know the mass. We have only one being to search for if you want. We are not doing multiple testing. But still, we have systematic uncertainties, so people are careful. Uh, and the, the safeguard that five sigma give you is not enough sometimes. So one quick example of what can happen. Imagine that uh, you have a five sigma effect in your data, but the uncertainty on uh, the data is dominating. It's actually systematics dominated. It's not, it's not a statistical fluke. And, uh, you don't know your systematics well enough because you underestimated them by a factor of two. So you think that uh, the, 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 
the bias that you have as a certain Gaussian distribution and you misunderstand the width of that distribution by a factor of two. And, and so this five sigma effect is actually a 2.5 sigma effect because, because of this uh, uh, problem that you had. So the researcher says, okay, well, I made a sloppy job. Okay, I misunderstood my systematic by a factor of two. Do you want to kill me? Yes, I do want to kill you because you misunderstood not as V value in terms of P value, you misunderstood the p-value by a factor of 20,000. Okay, so this is the kind of problem you get when you misunderstand the tails of your distribution. So be very careful, because what matters is the p-value. The z-value is just, uh, just uh, a, a shortcut, okay? And I can actually prove you that this is the case in particle physics, because there's a guy, Matt Ross. Incidentally, I was showing this slide in Helsinki uh, seven years ago, and I was giving a seminar, and there's a guy in the back row, and it's Matt Ross. <laughs> so this guy was still there, and, uh, and we had a nice chat afterwards. So I show this graph. Uh, this guy and some collaborators considered uh, a lot of measurements that in the 70s and before had been done of kaon and pion masses and lifetimes and branching ratios. We had a lot of data already there. And we had measured many, many parameters. And we had measured them very poorly at the beginning, but then as the instruments grew better, we were starting to have very precise measurements. So we knew what those values were. So when you have the true value, because, well, imagine that you had the measurements here of this value, of this variable, and then one day you have a better accelerator and you have this uncertainty. So you know that the, the true value of this branching ratio or something is here. And then you can look at the residuals of all of these measurements with respect to the true value. You can plot the distribution of residuals of all these measurements. So that's what he did. He did plot a residual distribution for many, many different values of quantities measured by, standard, by, by high energy physics. And what he found was that this, this, this distribution is called the pool distribution. This distribution was not Gaussian. That's the problem because if it is not a Gaussian distribution, your pool, it means that there are some uh, uncertainties you have not computed correctly. And their tails are not Gaussian or uh, something fishy has gone on. In fact, it could fit this distribution of residuals to a student 10 distribution. And the student 10 distribution, well, it looks Gaussian, right? Well, I mean, this is one sigma. Well, maybe you're wrong by some, a little bit on the one sigma. But the student 10 has fatter tails than the Gaussian. So here is the, the two distributions compared. And this is uh, the ratio, the, the integral of these distributions that you integrate when you integrate from a point to infinity. And the ratio of these two integral distributions, that is the ratio of the fat tail of the student with respect to the tail of the Gaussian, gets to a factor of 1,000 by the time you get to 5 sigma. What this means is that we are 1,000 times more likely to quote a 5 sigma effect than we should given our estimated uncertainties. That means that we misunderstand the uh, fluctuations for discoveries a thousand times more than we should. And why? That's because we, we are good at uh, trying to understand our systematics, but it's difficult to measure particles. There are unknown unknowns, so to speak, and they will uh, seep up and, and, and find their way to give you fatter tails. So we have to be careful, okay? And there's a bigger study of residuals that were done uh, by uh, David Bailey uh, maybe five or six years ago, and he investigated many, many different data sets. And you see these distributions are pool distributions, and a pool distribution should have this dotted line. It's a unit Gaussian going down in a semi-log plot. So these are really Z values. And uh, you see that uh, the Z values of various different kinds of data sets have fat tails that are enormous with respect to the Gaussian. 
So the probability of seeing a, I don't know, six, seven sigma effect is enhanced by orders and orders of magnitude. And this is a proof because he has taken many, many values. Okay, he didn't consider some correlated systematics and stuff, but the results I think are striking because it seems ubiquitous we have uh, student t distributions in our z values. This is a warning sign. We have to be careful, okay? We are good at estimated one sigma uncertainties, but this is the bulk of a distribution which is maybe not Gaussian and it has fat tails. So one asks the question, Okay, but uh, you are a frequentist, you are trying to evaluate this significance by doing your tail probabilities all along. Why don't you marry the Bayesian approach? Why don't you take a Bayesian standpoint? So what do Bayesians have to offer in exchange for the, uh, the, the, the Z values? So let's consider an null hypothesis. Uh, on which we base a strong belief, the standard model, okay? In physics, we do believe in our point null estimates. This is a simple point null estimate, a theory value that is valid for a specific value of a parameter. So the photon mass has, is zero, okay? Or, uh, I don't know, you could, you could, the charge of the proton is equal to the charge of the electron. These are, these are fixed point, point, point hypotheses, okay? And in other disciplines, this is not true. They, can all, they will argue, okay, that the, re, the, the, the point null hypothesis doesn't exist. You always have a distribution of values. No, in particle physics, we do believe that the parameters of nature do have a particular value, albeit unknown. So comparing a point null to an alternative hypothesis, which has a continuous support for theta, uh, well, this requires a Bayesian to encode the belief, the prior, to find the prior that encodes this. So what we need to do is to put a probability mass at a certain value of theta zero. So I have a 50% belief that the photon mass is zero, and then the rest of the, my prior probability is that the mass is not zero, but it must be very small because we measured it to be very small. So it maybe is a Gaussian with a width of 10 to a minus 18 EV or something like that. But we have to put a, a delta of Dirac at zero because that is the null hypothesis. And the use of priors with probability masses in simple versus composite tests like this setup throws a monkey wrench in the calculation of the Bayesian method. Because no matter how large and precise is the data, so now you collect more and more data and do the hypothesis test. In the limit that, uh, uh, that even if you go to infinity of data, so you reason, oh, but if I have infinity of data, it doesn't matter what prior I chose, right? Because the prior is only, yeah, it's subjective, but I can exchange one prior for the other. I let the likelihood speak. In the limit of infinite uh, statistics, it's the likelihood that counts. When I multiply the likelihood by the prior, no. In uh, this kind of setup, no matter how large is the data, Bayesian inference will depend on your prior, terribly depend on your prior. Somebody put 50% on the photon mass being zero, somebody put 58%, results will differ wildly. So this is a problem, and it's called the jeffries lindley paradox. And in fact, the, the, the paradox says something slightly different, but very connected to this. It says uh, that Bayesians and frequentists will draw opposite conclusions on some data when they compare a point null to a composite alternative. And this becomes true in the limit of infinite data. So it is not mended by asymptotics, if you want. So it bears on how you can define the statistical significance in Bayesian terms. So let's look at how it arises. So we take some data that are IID uh, with a Gaussian uh, distribution, okay? And uh, we have a parameter of interest theta, and we have a prior belief on theta, which is a mixture of a point mass at theta equals theta zero, and the rest of the probability uniformly distributed in, uh, in a certain interval. So, this is your prior. Your prior is uh, now a uniform distribution with 
a Dirac delta, and this has 50% of the p-value, and this has 50% of the p-value. This is a possible setup. It's just an example, okay? So when we do frequency statistic, the critical values of the sample mean, because you are looking for the mean of the data to determine which of these distributions is, is, is uh, correct, and the, the, the critical region that uh, you can draw to decide on uh, the validity of one model versus the other uh, is uh, a region which depends on how big is the data, so it will go down with square root of n as the error on the mean goes, uh, times the, the z value that you want to, to set. But okay, you have a certain window, and the window will shrink as you increase your data because it, you will be able to do more precise inference on the location. So, so this is your prior. You see you have a Dirac delta at theta zero and the rest is uniformly spread in a certain interval. And then you collect your data and the data will have some uncertainty, but this uncertainty will shrink as the square root of n goes to infinity. And so it is an interval. And so you see that uh, the, the data will, uh, will uh, start to, uh, to be in the, in the region that favors the alternative hypothesis and not the null hypothesis, so that is the, the point mass that you put here, uh, more and more precisely as the data shrink, uh, and as the, the, the uncertainty on x shrinks. So the paradox here is that the posterior probability that the null hypothesis is true, conditional on seeing data in the critical region that you have defined, that is a region that doesn't uh, accept uh, this point of theta parameter space, uh, the probability that this happens approaches one. So for a Bayesian, the probability that you accept the alternative becomes one, uh, although you are in the critical region where, where you have an infinite data set, you should be able to accept the null. So basically, a Bayesian and, 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 and uh, a, a, a frequentist will uh, draw opposite conclusions upon seeing uh, data in this kind of setup when n becomes large. And this has been shown to be a, a, a arising when you have uh, this kind of point mass uh, situation. And uh, this uh, makes it such that you have three independent scales in the problem. So you have the scale of your prior for the alternative, you have the scale of the prior for the null, and you have a scale that varies with the amount of data that you have, which is, which is this one. And so, so okay, I, there is a formal, the, um, a formal uh, proof of this, but I, I will leave out because uh, it doesn't concern us. But this is a very common situation in high energy physics where we have a point null, the cross-section for supersymmetry is zero, and an alternative hypothesis, the cross-section for supersymmetry is not zero. We are, we are always doing this, basically. So, and we are always in this situation where if we take a Bayesian standpoint, uh, we need a prior, and uh, the prior with point mass will screw us up. I have an example for you because I think uh, this might have been a little bit cryptic. So imagine we have tracks in a tracker. This is the Delphi tracker. And tracks uh, have the property of having positive or negative charge. And you know, reconstructing tracks uh, is a tricky business. It's pattern recognition. You might be failing more for positive tracks than for negative tracks. This would be a problem. It would affect with a systematic uncertainty all of your measurements or many of your measurements. So we want to take a lot of data from Delphi and test whether our tracking reconstruction as a bias towards positive or negative tracks. So we have a million tracks, and uh, we have these two numbers. We have uh, positive charges are a little less than negative charges. Let's test the hypothesis that the fraction of positive tracks is exactly 50%, with a test size of 5%. All right? So if we are Bayesians, we need a prior on R. 
And uh, what can you do? I mean, you have to say, I think my tracker is unbiased. I put a certain amount of probability at, five, uh, at 0 0.5. But OK, it might be that the tracker has a bias, so I need to put uh, the rest of my probability in a certain range, probably not between 0 and 1, but maybe between 49% and 51%. I don't know, something like that. You need to put a prior, though. So you need to choose what, uh, how to play out your probability. And uh, we are in high statistics. We have a million tracks away from 0 and 1 uh, in the ratio. This is a binomial ratio experiment. And you remember that the world interval for the binomial has this kind of formula, which is very bad when n is small. But here we are in very high statistics region. So this is ex an excellent test statistic, OK? So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the variance that you get uh, for the fraction, the fraction, uh, the binomial fraction R. And you see that it goes down uh, with N, of course. So the probability that we observe a number of positive tracks can be written as a normal with a mean X and a sigma given by this value, when X is the ratio that you got. So now we can compute the posterior probability given this prior. And uh, don't be scared by this formula. These are all Gaussians. The probability that the ratio is a half, given a certain ratio observed and a certain number of data points uh, considered a million, is, uh, uh, is uh, this number is uh, uh, the Gaussian for uh, x compared to 1 half divided by this sigma. Uh, normalized to this integral. Why? Because I am taking uh, uh, the probability that the ratio is a half as, a, as this part of the, of the prior, so one half, okay? So I give it uh, one half, and this is uh, uh, coming apart from one half by just by fluctuations. So this is, this is the probability that the ratio is indeed one half. And this comes out to be 97.8%. So this is the posterior obtained by multiplying the prior with the data and normalized. This is Bayes' theorem, OK? And we get a probability that's very high. What it means is that Bayesians will accept the null hypothesis. Uh, there is no evidence against the bias, uh, against the, the ratio being exactly what you expect. And in fact, the data strongly support the null hypothesis because the p-value is much, much larger than alpha. We have uh, questions? No. OK. Now, frequentists will instead calculate how often you get a result at least as extreme as finding 480,000 tracks or whatever it is uh, by chance if the underlying distribution is actually with r equals a half and the, the, the uncertainty that we have computed with world interval. So you compute the tail probability that x fluctuates below 49.88 if it should have been 0 0.5. And this is a tail integral from 0 to 0 0.4998 of a Gaussian. And it comes out to be 8 per mil. But you have to test. Uh, but you didn't know beforehand if you would get a smaller or larger number of uh, positive tracks. So for you, it's the same. So we have to multiply by a trials factor of two. So in the end, we get a probability that uh, the tracker is unbiased of 1.6%. You see, we are drawing exactly the opposite conclusion than a Bayesian does. So the tracker is biased, says the frequentist, because I'm getting a tail probability that's very small. So this is the paradox. And it has been used in literature by Bayesians to criticize the way that the inference is made by frequentists. So in fact, Jeffries himself was quoted to say, what the use of the p-value implies, therefore, is that a hypothesis that may be true may be rejected because it has not predicted observable results that have not occurred. <laughs> so he has put it in a way that makes uh, frequentists sound very silly, right? And. Uh, Still, a Bayesian approach doesn't offer a substitute because, because uh, of, this, uh, of this problem that, uh, that I said, that it, uh, 
asymptotically depend on the prior so much. This is something I didn't show, but the fact that the point mass was chosen at 50%, if you redo the calculation with 40%, you will find a totally different result. Do it for yourself if you want. And uh, Bayesians uh, have base factor, which has the, 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 the ratio of posterior to prior odds. But uh, this, uh, this uh, will retain a dependence on the scale of the prior that we discussed. So OK, to make a story short, the trouble of uh, the, if you want, the arbitrariness of the five sigma point that frequentists will have, uh, which is a subject of debate uh, in statistics today even. Uh, but, well, there we are talking about it when we discuss uh, medicine or psychology when they have a type 1 error rate of 5%. There's a lot of debate if you look in statistic features, uh, recent statistic literature. But we have it as well. We pick a, a five sigma point here. And this trouble is not solved easily by going Bayesian, okay? And now I need to, to hurry up, really, because it's already 10 a.m. So, okay, the Neyman Pearson's lemma I mentioned before is that you have a simple versus simple hypothesis testing. Then uh, you can check uh, the, the difference between these two uh, simple hypotheses, you know, the parameter theta, the mass is 125 or the mass is 130. You can, uh, you can write uh, uh, the size and the power uh, as uh, integrals of the distribution functions of the data under the null and under the alternative hypothesis this way. Uh, you know, these are tail distributions in the critical region of, of the two uh, test statistics. And, uh, and uh, you want to find uh, the critical region such that you maximize power given a certain type 1 error rate. And uh, you can rewrite the expression for power by factoring out the PDF for the null hypothesis. And you realize that this becomes an expectation value in the critical region of this ratio. And this is exactly the likelihood ratio. And so you can, you can choose a region uh, based on uh, this ratio being as high as possible. And it automatically maximizes your odds of, of discriminating the two hypotheses. So this is the Neyman Pearson's lemma, and uh, it has uh, some uh, requirements for it to be valid. And, uh, and if you are in a situation where the two hypotheses are simple, then this really is what you should do. You should uh, define the critical region based on the ratio of the likelihood of the two hypotheses, given the data that you have. Sorry if I go fast, but uh, I accept questions whenever you want. Um, and then there are systematic uncertainties. Systematics will affect your measurements. We have seen cases already, right? Uh, so for instance, in particle physics, we count how many events of a certain kind we, we have. But then we have the problem of converting that number into a cross-section. And doing that will require you to multiply by the luminosity, to divide by the efficiency for considering the uh, efficiency of the trigger and other factors. And all of these factors have to be estimated by other experiments, maybe throwing Monte Carlo to get the efficiency for the signal, or checking what the, is the inelastic cross-section of protons to get the luminosity at a collider. All of these things uh, will come with additional uncertainties and will pollute your measurement of n, which is just n and it has a Poisson fluctuation, and will introduce modeling biases. And these are the systematics that uh, uh, arise because of measurements which are subsidiary to the main result, but you cannot do without if you want to extract inference on uh, a, a, a parameter of nature. So this introduces complications, and there are methods to treat it, and Bayesians have their method that uh, involves con constructing a multidimensional prior distribution which includes all of the parameters, all of these, uh, all of these uh, additional parameters. And then uh, you can integrate all of these nuisances out uh, if, you, if you have modeled the thing correctly. 
and you get uh, the PDF of your uh, parameter of interest, the cross section itself given the data. Instead, uh, the classical frequentist treatment is to scan the space of the nuisance parameters in each point of the values of this, the, the, the statistic, the, the systematic uncertainties, uh, you do an Eman construction and obtain, therefore, a multidimensional confidence interval. And then you can project this multidimensional confidence interval, which is not uh, an interval in one dimension, but will become a, a more complex region. You will project it out on the parameter of interest and obtain uh, the confidence interval on the parameter of interest. I am sorry, I have no examples for this because it becomes complicated in real life and uh, we are short of time. And instead, the likelihood ratio uh, way is to profile the likelihood. What it, does it mean to profile the likelihood? It means that the likelihood will have a certain shape for the parameter of interest that you are testing. And uh, typically, you will extract uh, an interval by doing delta log likelihood equals one half, right? But you can, you can uh, ask if, uh, for every value of the parameter of interest, you vary the nuisance parameters, and you find the, the maximum value that the likelihood can have by changing the value of the nuisance parameters. And so this, uh, this is for this, the central value of the nuisance parameters might become a much broader likelihood distribution because you are finding the maximum over a lot of possible realizations of nature in each of which uh, the jet energy change, scale has changed, the luminosity has changed, uh, the trigger efficiency has changed. And so if you vary from uh, jet energy scale equals one to jet energy scale is equal 0.9, you allow the likelihood to readjust itself for the data and grow. And so your profile likelihood will be integrating and not integrating, is maximizing over all these other dimensions and the likelihood grows flatter and therefore the interval grows larger. This is called profile likelihood method. And it's minus, minus uh, uh, migrad, sorry, what gives you this. So, each of these methods has its own problems. In Bayesian case, uh, it's hard to define priors in multiple dimensions, and it depends on what you, what you decide for the parameterization of the multidimensional space to be. The classical description has over coverage problems, I mean, which becomes uh, tougher in multiple dimensions, and it becomes intractable to do this name and construction in multiple dimensions. And the likelihood uh, method is actually the most practical one, but it uh, starts to have under coverage in several situations. In many cases, uh, we have uh, grown uh, uh, wary and we have started to use a hybrid method for integrating nuisance parameters in a Bayesian way, even if we are doing a, a frequency construction. This actually has some, some, uh, some merits or we profile away the nuisance parameters and then use any other method because this profiling is actually very effective and, and, uh, and, uh, and practical. You maximize a function. Uh, all right. I promised I would talk about goodness of fit tests. I will do it very, very quickly, but because, you know, basically once you do hypothesis testing, Doing, uh, doing goodness of fit is the same thing as doing hypothesis testing, only you only have the null hypothesis. You don't have the alternative. You have a test statistic under the null hypothesis itself, and you compare the data to the distribution of the null hypothesis. So you don't have alpha and beta, you only have alpha to deal with, right? Uh, so you don't specify the alternative, you only have IH0. When you have only an, an null hypothesis, uh, the problem becomes uh, that uh, it's hard to decide what goodness of fit test to do. You could use a chi-square test and extract the probability of the chi-square that, that, uh, that your data fulfills and uh, is in accordance to the model, the standard model or whatever you have chosen as your null. You could do a Kolmogorov-Smirnov test that integrates the distribution of your data 
and compares it to the distribution. Uh, so what I'm talking about, I'll actually, I have a slide on, on the Kolmogorov test, so I, won't, I will go fast. But the point is that there is no answer to this question. What goodness of fit test should I use? Some of you were asking me this question uh, a couple of days ago. There is no answer because uh, it depends on the problem. Really, a, a, a test that is good for a certain kind of class of problems, it's bad for others. For instance, if you are concerned about uh, having some events in the tail of a distribution, the Kolmogorov test will not catch it, will be completely insensitive of, the, of events in the tail of a distribution because it's testing basically the location of your distribution of the data. It's testing the mean. Instead, the chi-square might be more sensitive to excess of events in the tails of a distribution. Um, so, yeah, so you might, have, uh, you might have situations where some tests are bad. Uh, and, and you can always test against relevant alternative hypotheses. So I'm doing a goodness of fit test, so I'm only concerned with H0. But I can still look at what possible alternative hypotheses would give me the distribution of the data under uh, other, other hypotheses, the distribution of the test statistic I'm using other, under other hypotheses. And I can make a feeling for how, how well the chi-square method does in catching the alternative in under, under question or some other alternative. So I can always look at the power for specified alternatives. And I can understand whether a method works better than another. And if you do that, you realize that uh, there are peculiarities. I said this already. The chi-square test is just checking the fluctuation of the data in a distribution with respect to a certain model by summing up the squared deviations of the data with respect to the model. And by doing that, it completely neglects uh, the ordering of the data. We said that already. And instead, I told you already, the Kolmogorov test, uh, the test the mean of a distribution, is only sensitive to big biases that shift the whole distribution. Uh, and it is hard to define. Uh, OK, I won't go there. Uh, and there is a duality with confidence intervals because when you derive a confidence interval around the value of a parameter you have estimated, it's just like testing the hypothesis that that parameter is there versus the hypothesis that it is elsewhere. And you can define a test, a power of the test, and you can define the critical region such that it has alpha probability. And, uh, and uh, there is an analog with uh, with uh, with uh, goodness of fit. Uh, there is a difference in statistical terms, but we won't get there. So we use uh, goodness of fit tests uh, in a number of ways uh, in, for checks uh, of the models that we are using uh, for validation of some data sets or some procedures for validation of a model. And uh, uh, so, uh, it's, it's an important topic. Okay, so what we have to do when we do this is to not only finding a suitable test statistic and then a suitable, uh, a suitable goodness of fit test, but also a region of interest. So you have to decide how, 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 how much uh, departure in your data you accept. <laughs> and there are, and choosing the region of interest is actually uh, totally arbitrary. So there is famously Feynman who said one day, upon walking here this morning, the strangest thing ever happened to me. A car passed by and I could read the plate, JKZ0533. How weird is that? Because the probability, if you think about it, that I saw exactly such combination of letters and numbers is one in uh, 88 millions. So he, he was saying, I observed something, and the observation is very, very rare. But this is a posterioriness. This is the trouble with uh, 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 deriving a p-value for something that you have ob observed after the fact. It's, of, of course, uh, very rare that you find exactly that plate. But after you find it, the probability is 1, right? 
So you have not defined beforehand the region of interest of your search. So if you define the region of interest after the fact, after collecting the data, this is invalid. You have to do it before, OK? You would have to wake up in the morning and say, I would be very startled to go to the office this morning and find a plate with this number. And then if you see it, then you are allowed to say that it is kind of rare. This is a more apt example in our, in our practice. You have a counting experiment where the background is predicted to be 100 events. So this is the Poisson of 100, OK? And you observe 80 events. How rare is it to observe 80 events? So a frequentist will be, his jerk, his knee jerk reaction will be to integrate from 0 to 80, tail probability in the critical region defined by the observation. Defined by the observation. So you have observed 80, so you define the critical region afterwards. This is uh, uh, troublesome, right? Or you might say, OK, I have observed 20 events away from the mean, but uh, I would be just as startled to observe 120. So I have to take these two tail probabilities and add them together. So it is an ill-posed question because uh, it depends on whether you are interested in excesses or absolute departures, but it also be, uh, might be spun in a different way. In, in, in these two cases, uh, you have a different tail probability by a factor of two or so. But one might actually imagine that one does a different question to the data. And so what is the probability of observing exactly 80 events when you expect 100? This is 10 e to the minus 100 by 100 to the 80 divided by 80 factorial. Good luck computing this number with a laptop. But it's, of course, a, a, a stupid a stupid question because you're not interested in one particular realization, right? You, you, you would like to test models, so you're not exactly interested in 80. There is nothing special in the number 80. I have an example for the Kolmogorov test, uh, but I won't go into it because it's late. But uh, uh, this is basically what it is. You, you, you compute the cumulative distribution of some data that you have. This is the red data that we have. And this is the cumulative distribution of the data as you integrate, uh, for instance, the rapidity of the primary lecton in this CDF analysis from minus infinity to plus infinity. And you also have two, one model, this green line, let's say. And this also has its own cumulative distribution, uh, this green line. And the Kolmogorov test uh, finds the largest difference between these two functions difference in the vertical scale. And this is a test statistic. It's the number between 0 and 1. And it is the largest if the two distributions are farther apart in the means. It doesn't have anything to do with the tails of the distribution, because by the time you reach the tails, you are at integral 0 or 1. And here, you cannot have a large departure. That is why the Kolmogorov test is insensitive to the tails. I had, a nice, uh, I, I had a nice anecdote to tell you about the CDF analysis and uh, the stuff that uh, went about it. So, but I, I will not go into that. And uh, I, you will find these slides. You can read them. They are kind of readable, I think. So you will also be able to ask yourself uh, how you combine p-values. because, And this is actually an important thing to, to know. But there are many different ways to combine small numbers. If you multiply many small numbers, what do you get? You get zero. But that's not the probability of the product. Uh, you need to somehow correct for the fact that all these numbers are, be, are smaller than one. And uh, so you could uh, cast the question in many different ways. And there is a way to do it that is a little bit better than others. But actually, there are many, many ways that are all legal. And I think Fisher had a paper about that. But one way to correct for this is to use this formula. And you can try it uh, for yourself. Uh, well, we can try it together. <laughs> Sorry. You can take five numbers that are really distributing evenly between 0 and 1, so a null distribution, uh, even distribution between 0 and 1. OK? Five p-values. Their product is very small, because they're all between 0 and 1. 
And if the formula, you see that the probability of seeing them is 50% as expected. And if instead you take one of them being very, very small, but the other being uniformly distributed, the result is small, but not, not, not so much small as the, the smallest of the five. So this accounts for the fact that only one of them, and it didn't say which one beforehand, is small. Uh, so there are many examples. Uh, you can read them. Uh, and you could have five numbers all small. 0.05, 0.10, 0.15, 0.20, 0.25. This is odd because they are all small. This should tell you, oh, maybe there is something in my model that is wrong. In fact, the test for the product tells a number which is not uh, really remarkable. Uh, I have a program that if you want, you can download that will show you how to combine these numbers. But if you had asked a different question, like uh, what is the chance that the five numbers are all smaller than 0 0.25, rather than testing for their product, you would have gotten a different answer, much more, much more stringent. So the a posteriori choice of the test that you apply is really uh, illegal, OK? You cannot do it. If you, if you decide after having seen the data that you will ask a different question, what what is the probability of the product? What, what is the probability that all of them are smaller than a certain amount? That is, can, cannot be done. So these are the numbers for the Poisson, for the p-values of the Kolmogorov test of the analysis in CDF compared to some reference model. But I won't go there. And, uh, and let's skip this as well. Um, So we have seen the problem of evaluating the significance in accounting experiments in a number of ways during these this few days. And, uh, and uh, we have always been doing this by comparing the data to a null hypothesis, right? This is what we do to extract the significance. Uh, so let's, let's think about it uh, for a while longer. So, Imagine you have a counting experiment. You expect uh, B events from background, and you test for a signal contribution that gives you, in addition, S events from a Poisson process. And this is the relevant probability density function of your data in case you have B and you have S. So when you observe a certain number of events, you can do this uh, uh, probability of uh, observing at least uh, this number of events, as we have said. You just uh, compute the the tail probability uh, this way. And this is not the probability of the null hypothesis being true. Again, it is the probability of the data, right? Uh, so for instance, one case that gives you a five sigma discovery will be observing 10 events when you expect 1.1 from background. Uh, so these are cases that will give you a five sigma discovery. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have to apologize because I, I think this slide belonged somewhere else. So because I'm not sure I can make a point here. So OK, but uh, they were examples of five sigma that uh, had to do with the previous discussion. So I told you about Wilkes theorem. Uh, that is basically telling you, telling you about the regularity of the likelihood function. We discussed the fact that the likelihood uh, is bad, uh, as the likelihood intervals uh, have bad coverage properties when there are few events that you are using. And that is because uh, the, the likelihood is non-parabolic. You are far from the asymptotic limit where the central limit holds, where everything becomes Gaussian and your likelihood becomes parabolic. Uh, and Wilkes theorem, in a sense, uh, uh, is connected to this, as we'll see. So let's test, uh, let's try a problem where we test uh, for the presence of a Gaussian signal on top of some background by fitting some distribution. So you have uh, a typical example in particle physics, and if I have time, we'll discuss this also for the X, but you have a distribution that uh, distributes for a null hypothesis. Maybe this is the mass of some unknown particle. And you want to test whether you have a signal that is Gaussian on top of it. 
And you can fit it for the background alone, and you can fit it for the background plus the signal. So we have two hypotheses, the null and the alternative are, are specified by these two shapes. And so you can extract the local significance of this peak. Which is, what is the local significance? It is the probability that the, the probability that you get this data at this particular point, uh, if the null hypothesis is true, uh, by doing the likelihood fits and the comparing the two likelihoods, right? You take the difference of the two likelihoods uh, and uh, you obtain a p-value from, uh, from the chi-squared uh, that corresponds to that uh, log likelihood difference. You then can convert that p-value in the number of sigma and you get a significance number. So this is, this is uh, very quick and easy to do. And this is using Wilkes theorem. And Wilkes theorem basically tell you that you can convert a log, a log likelihood number into a chi-squared uh, in this particular case. And you can do this because you have a two nested, one nested hypothesis into the other. So you can convert a, a likelihood ratio a, a, or a log likelihood difference into a chi-squared and proceed to compute a p-value for the alternative hypothesis versus the null if the function that you are comparing to the null hypothesis converts to, uh, is, is embedded, is nested into the null hypothesis. So it becomes the null hypothesis for a particular value of the extra parameters that describe the alternative. So in this case, uh, if uh, you have specified the mass of the particle, then the only parameter that, and the sigma of the Gaussian, the only parameter that uh, divides uh, the two hypotheses is, is the, the, the normalization of the signal. So for zero normalization of the signal, the uh, model for signal plus background becomes the model for the background. So in this case, you are fulfilling one of the requirements of Wilkes theorem that will prove that the chi-squared can be converted into, the log likelihood can be converted in a chi-squared. So this, this fact that these two quantities are akin uh, depend, in fact, they are not equal, but the, the log likelihood will, co will converge to the chi-square distribution uh, very fast as you increase the number of data that you are using if uh, you are fulfilling Wilkes, uh, uh, Wilkes uh, requirements, that is nesting, and that is uh, also that there are no other parameters. So uh, this is nested hypothesis. Uh, but if you allow the mass of the unknown signal to vary in the fit, violates another condition that Wilkes theorem must, uh, must fulfill, that you must fulfill in order to apply Wilkes theorem. Uh, because uh, if you put the signal to zero, you have, uh, you, so you have an alternative, a nuisance parameter that is only present in the alternative hypothesis because you set the cross-section to zero and you have uh, the mass that varies. So you have a parameter uh, exceeding in, the, in, in this case. So uh, you, you typically cannot apply Wilkes theorem if you have an, a, a parameter or, that is only present in the alternative hypothesis, the mass of the particle that is not present in the background hypothesis. But still we use the Wilkes theorem because it approximately works. And so we derive uh, p-values from uh, likelihood ratios of the null and the alternative hypothesis. We are often in this situation that if we look for a bump, we look for the likelihood of the two hypotheses, take the ratio, equate to a chi-squared, get a p-value, get a z-value. This is normally done, okay? And, uh, and this has been studied even recently in the case uh, for, for the X search. People have been looking at this in much detail for the kind of experimental conditions under which we were working. For, the, for instance, this particular histogram I, I'm, I'm pick, depicting here is the, exactly the case of looking for the X to die photon in the mass of photon pairs in CMS and Atlas. So people have been looking at this in, in much detail. 
And so they have convinced themselves that uh, in the particular cases that we are uh, working, uh, these things work, Wilkes theorem can be applied, we can, uh, we can use this. And actually the test statistic that uh, the combined, the Higgs combined tool is using and that has been constructed to extract inference on the presence of the Higgs boson in the data and which is now used in a lot of searches by CMS and Atlas, not just the X, of course, but hundreds of searches, is uh, making use of this. Um, yeah, one important fact is that you have the trials factor. Like once you obtain a local significance by taking this ratio of likelihoods and converting to a p-value for the chi-squared, you need to account for the multiplicity of places where you are actually doing this because, you know, those... Uh, red and uh, green bands uh, of, uh, of p-values uh, or of confidence limits that are drawn in these cases. To, we will see one later on, but uh, they are obtained by testing hypotheses for different values of the mass in many, many points of the axis, which is the mass of the particle, because we don't know the x mass. We have to do it in all of these places. So we are doing multiple testing. So we need to correct the significance that we get for any particular fluctuation that we get by the number of places where we have looked at. A rule of thumb is to look at the, the width of the histogram that we have scanning, we are scanning, and divide it, by, divide it by, by the scale which is given by the width of the signal. But this is a very rough method. And in fact, there is a paper by Gross and Vitels that has uh, uh, investigated this in a, in a much uh, more tidy way, and they have come up with a very good recipe for correcting this kind of searches and obtain a global p-value and a global significance of the excess being anywhere. Since you have looked in many places, we will maybe get there. <laughs> so, yeah, this is what uh, uh, the rule of thumb I was saying. Uh, uh, you can use it, or you can run toys. You can simulate the experimental conditions a million times every time you extract uh, the p-value, but you are always simulating data under the null hypothesis, and you are fitting for an additional signal on top of it, and you obtain a p-value from looking how many times you get, uh, you get a, a, a significant departure, and then you compare to the data that you have. Uh, and this is impractical in the case of the X uh, boson search because the X boson search was done by combining tens of different uh, search channels, diphotons, four leptons, two muons, two electrons, jets, etc., with many systematics. So it was impossible to do the, this kind of work. So asymptotic uh, uh, rules uh, had to be used and were used. And in fact, this paper I mentioned by Gross and Vitels were very useful to estimate the look elsewhere effect. Uh, okay, never mind what I'm saying here. Uh, okay. So this is the paper I was mentioning, uh, and uh, there is a better rule of thumb that is uh, evaluated by these guys, uh, and that has to do with, uh, with uh, with a formula which uh, probably I have a slide for it later. So let's move on. Because, yes, I, I, I asked uh, the organizers if they could give me 10 more minutes uh, this is today because really we can quickly go through the, the material concerning how the X searches at the LHC were done. So, you know, the X boson has been sought by Atlas and CMS in many different final states. Because the X can be produced in many different ways, as you see in this graph, as a function of the mass, the cross-section is very different. And so this has lots of implications. So some searches are more precise and others are less precise. But then it also depends on the mass, uh, what is the branching fraction of the X boson decaying in different final states. So depending on the mass that we didn't know at the time we were searching, uh, you could uh, be looking for it uh, primarily in two W bosons or two Z bosons, but if it had a lower mass, so then it would be better to study it by looking at, uh, at uh, two photons, which has a very small branching fraction here, actually here, 10 to the minus 3, but it's very, very distinctive if you want, even if there, it has a lot of background. 
So all of these searches had to be compared because we were not expecting that we would be getting a lot of significance for any, from any of these channels alone. So we had to combine uh, uh, all of these uh, evidences together. And uh, the importance of this goal brought together a lot of people to define and to refine the procedures that combined all this information uh, in a statistically sound way. And they came up with a recipe. So the recipe that they come up with uh, must be explained in steps very quickly. Uh, you write a global likelihood. You always start with a likelihood. You get the date. You, you, you write the likelihood that you would get some data given uh, a certain mass of the X boson and a number of systematic uncertainties as a, a product of Poisson, uh, of Poisson distributions of observing a certain number of events given a certain uh, uh, a certain uh, uh, cross-section, which you multiply by a factor mu, which is a scale factor for the signal cross-section. And the signal and the background cross-section uh, will depend on, on, on these nuisance parameters. And then you multiply this by a prior probability. So this, see, this is a frequentist calculation, but it uses a prior. This is called a hyper prior on the nuisance parameters. We expect that we have measured these parameters, that these ancillary parameters, ancillary, because they affect the uncertainty, not the central value. Huh? Uh, but we have measured them in other previous measurements. So this is a prior in, in a frequentist setting. And then, uh, uh, and this I just said. So if we have this uh, likelihood, and uh, we can take a product of Poisson factors for many different uh, final states and many different counting experiments. Or we could have an unbind likelihood uh, over uh, a number of events that were observed uh, where you have a certain fraction of signal that you expect multiplied by its own PDF plus a fraction of background multiplied by its own PDF. And you can combine all these Poisson factors into a giant likelihood, okay? It will have uh, tens of different uh, factors combined. So it's a product of probabilities, which you then take the likely, the, the, the logarithm of. And you construct a profile likelihood test statistic. This is the test statistic that you want to test. And it's, uh, you want, you see, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a logarithm of the likelihoods. So it's a difference of, of logarithm of likelihoods, if you want, because you can explicitate this. And this is the likelihood of the data given a certain signal strengths. So that is to say, I, I expect, the standard model tells me what this cross-section for the X would be, but I allow it to vary because I actually don't trust my model so much. I want to test uh, any possible, uh, any possible uh, uh, realization where the cross-section is enhanced or decreased. So I want to test for mu, and this will allow me to put, uh, uh, to make inference on the value of mu. So I will say that, uh, uh, we will see it later, but I can, I can actually set the intervals on mu. And if I exclude the value of one, it means that I have excluded the standard model leaks. And this theta mu hat says that I am maximizing the likelihood for the data that I observe for uh, uh, the value of theta that maximizes that particular value of mu that I am testing. And I divide by the maximum of the likelihood under any possible value of the cross-section and the, the nuisance parameters that maximize uh, for any value of the nuisance parameters. So the ratio of these two means that uh, if I test the probability that, uh, that if I test the hypothesis that uh, mu is, va is as a value of one, here I have to put the likelihood for mu equals one and this is a profile likelihood profiled for, for, for the nuisance parameters that maximize that particular hypothesis. And the denominator has all the values of mu, so I allow this to vary. So it's a kind of a strange construction, but it allows, uh, uh, it, has a, it, it has a distribution which is quite useful because uh, uh, it is uh, asymptotically uh, a chi-square tail distribution. We'll see it in a moment. Uh, and okay, there is a constraint on mu, and uh, it's a sort of uh, a, a CLS test statistic. It's different from the CLS, uh, 
which I have not introduced, but it's just one possible test statistic that one can combine uh, p-value for the null and the alternative hypothesis. Uh, and so these are technical details I want to delve with. But uh, uh, you can get the maximum likelihood values for the nuisance parameters and maximize this. And then here is the, the distribution that you can get, for instance, when uh, you have the X boson in the data according to the standard model, and then if you don't have it. So the signal region is uh, for small values of this test statistic. And, uh, uh, and uh, this kind of construction is, although weird, uh, as good, uh, as good properties asymptotically. And then you compare the observed value with uh, what you have for the two hypotheses, and you can derive the values of the test statistic. And, uh, and this is what I just said. You can derive a, a p value p mu, the probability that I would observe a test statistic larger than what I observe uh, if the signal plus background hypothesis holds. And this is a tail integral. And for the null hypothesis, I compute this number 1 minus b, that is the probability of seeing a, a, a this p-value, uh, this, this value of test statistic if the background only hypothesis is true. This is another integral. And then you do this uh, CLS construction, uh, but it's different from the CLS because of the way we define the test statistic. But you see, it's a, a ratio of tail probabilities. It is not a p-value. It is a ratio of p-values. Uh, so it is a kind of a strange thing that it doesn't exist in statistics. But the, 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 the division by the probability, by one of minus the probability of the background alone, it's a way to correct for the possibility that you have fluctuation. It's a sort of conservative way to not only look at the probability that you get a certain value of mu, but uh, you dump it in a way. Sorry for going so fast, but uh, we really have no time. Once we have this, uh, this number, we can exclude the alternative hypothesis when uh, this number is uh, uh, fluctuates to be too small, when we have defined the type 1 error rate. And this is a way that we derive, uh, that derive uh, uh, the intervals. And so you can derive the upper limit on mu for each value of the mass that you are testing. And you compute the, the cumulative PDF of the upper limits that you get. And this is still uh, you can do without having done any comparison with the data. And, uh, and then you can uh, derive the median of, uh, of the intervals of mu, which correspond to certain predefined value of the probability of the quantiles. And this will allow to, to, to draw intervals of mu at the one sigma and two sigma level. And so you get a, a, a confidence belt around the values of mu. OK. So and then you have a different way to test for the significance uh, of uh, the, the data that you get. Uh, uh, and you use a different test statistic, which is called Q0, which tests for a value of 0 for the cross section. And, uh, and then you derive a p-value by doing a tail integral again. And you can convert it into a number of st standard deviations. Uh, so you see, this is the distribution I was telling you about that uh, it has a nice property. This is the distribution of the test statistic for discovery significance uh, for a large number of toys under the null hypothesis when mu equals zero, it has these asymptotic properties that, uh, that can be derived analytically. So this is, by having constructed this Q0 test statistic in the way that I showed very fast, I'm sorry about that, but uh, you get uh, the possibility to describe it uh, with uh, an asymptotic formula, which uh, is easy to test. So instead of having to throw millions of toys, you can just test uh, where, how, how often you get the value so small of the test statistic by this, this uh, approximate formula. So this is very, very handy. And, uh, and OK. And then I was telling you about the Gross and Bittel's way to derive the trials factor for the X search. 
and uh, and uh, you can define the way to do this is to define a test statistic that uh, describe uh, all the possible mass values that you have tested and this is the max uh, of the q0 that you have seen for all the possible hy hypotheses that you have tested so you have this q0 test statistic in every search that you made and they can be small or, or larger and you take the maximum so that the, the, the one that is farther out in the tail of the distribution and once you have them uh, you can you can uh, you can look at this distribution and uh, this will have uh, a value for every possible tested value of the mass and so for instance this is a this is a toy monte carlo where you have a certain background distribution and you may have a gaussian bump on top of it and you have some data and you test uh, if you fit for this mass bump at any possible value of the mass and this uh, will give you a test statistic q at every boss possible value of the mass and it will fluctuate and sometimes be very high but many times will be smaller so how do you really evaluate uh, the number of places where you have looked for a bump like that that is uh, statistically independent from the others and the way to answer this question is not just to do a rule of thumb so you divide the range of the masses by the width of the signal as we saw before but you look really at this function and you take a certain threshold even at a low value and you count the number of up crossings the number of times that this red curve goes above the dashed line one two three because it, you only count the up crossings not the down crossings. so and you say okay because this test statistic has fluctuated a certain amount because i was looking for it many many times but it is correlated so if i look for a signal here or if i look for a signal very close to it the test statistic will not be able to change by a large amount so by looking at the number of up crossing above, above a certain reference level i'm actually estimating how much this test statistic fluctuates around that means how many times I have been looking for different bumps in this spectrum. And uh, so, uh, and then I can derive a correction from the local significance to the global significance by adding the number of up crossings. This is the formula that Gross and Vittels came up with. And uh, you can show that it has good properties and that it tracks the number of possible uh, realizations uh, that are independent of this search and uh, and uh, there are there is even an approximation for how this uh, number of up, up, up crossings vary when you vary this uh, this uh, level on the q0 test statistic okay so this is a um, technology that uh, allows you to compute the trials factor and to go from local to global Test statistic. Uh, I have an example for you, but I will leave you the job of looking at it by yourselves because I'm going to upload these slides very soon on Slack. And uh, I won't go into it because uh, I'm really uh, struggling here. So let me conclude uh, what we have seen in these uh, few days. So I hope you are convinced with me now that statistics is not trivial and not even in the simplest applications. We have seen the combination of two two of two, two values when there is a correlation it's already a nightmare and an understanding of the different methods uh, that you use to derive some results is crucial because uh, because uh, because there are many subtleties okay and uh, and the different uh, methods to answer our questions provide different results we are actually asking different questions if we apply a likelihood ratio test or, uh, or some other test. So the key that we have started to do often is to try and derive results with different methods and compare. Because this tells us really how different the questions were and uh, what kind of conclusions we can draw. It's, it's very good practice to do this. Um, so yeah, you should become an expert in statistics if you want to go, be a good particle physicist. Of course, now you need also to learn machine learning. Everybody is doing it. So you are here for a reason, I think. Uh, 
so the slides of this course uh, are just an appetizer that uh, just should be meant to introduce you to the topic and let you appreciate that there are many subtleties. But you must uh, put them to work by studying them. And then the best way is to actually try to solve problems through pseudo experiments, uh, try to do different things, test them. Test uh, your assumptions of a PDF, uh, change the PDF, and do pseudo experiments and see what happens to your results. This is very formative. And uh, now you can certainly appreciate that you should be careful about the statements that you make. So who talks bad thinks bad, right? So avoid probability inversion statements. Don't say that the probability of the standard model being correct is such, based on some data. Don't do that, please. And you could uh, avoid now being doing wrong inference on true parameter values. So. Uh, this is sim similar, right? The top mass has a probability of one sigma of being in this range because I measured it to be between 171 to 174. No, that is one confidence interval. It doesn't have the pro properties of coverage that you are implying. All the confidence intervals have the property of coverage. But the top mass is either inside your interval or outside. Remember that. And you should avoid apologetic sentences in your papers. Since we observe no significant departure from the background, we proceed to set up a limit. This is a posteriori. Don't do that. This is flip-flopping. Improper uses of the likelihood. The upper limit can be obtained as the 95% quantile of the likelihood function. No sense whatsoever. It's not a PDF. Don't integrate it. These are references. That's it. Please ask questions. Maybe during coffee break or later, because we are very late. But if you have urgent questions, I'm here. Yep. Um, so um, uh, just a few words on, on this set of lectures. Um, yeah. In in these last uh, four days, I think Thomaso brought a lot of uh, insight and uh, valuable um, input uh, over and above what he would find in a in a textbook from uh, from his experience and expertise of of years. I. Um, I would suggest that, so in some places the, the material was dense, but uh, all, uh, all the lectures are uh, recorded, so I would advise that you go back, uh, listen to the lectures carefully. Uh, what was discussed today is the whole mechanism, the statistical uh, uh, toolbox for, for Higgs discovery, and I believe that uh, that toolbox is now being used also in other areas like the the dark matter direct detection searches yeah, uh, yeah, yeah uh, are using this so it's very very important i mean you can easily produce the brazilian band green and yellow one sigma two sigma but uh, what we really discussed uh, this morning is is the statistical uh, toolbox with which you with which you get there so, and also there are many important references. Uh, go back and look into those, uh, those papers. And uh, with that, let's thank, uh, thank Tomaso again.